Uh, my name is Amanda McPhillan. I'm the manager of uh, programs and interpretive services for the historic New Orleans collection. I'm so delighted to have y'all all here this evening for our program, Showing Love, Parades, Mutual Aid, and the Importance of Place. I just wanna share a few notes about tonight's program and about the exhibition before I turn it over to our moderator, Rachel Brindlin with the Neighborhood Story Project to start our discussion for tonight. So our program tonight is part of an exhibition that is currently on view at the historic New Orleans called Dancing in the Streets. Uh, this exhibition has been up for a few months now. It is going to be up through June 13th. So we have one month left. And if you haven't had a chance to see it yet, I uh, highly encourage you to get down to the collection at 520 Royal Street to check it out um, in the next few weeks. And in fact, after I stop talking, I'm gonna post a link to the exhibition page in the chat. So if you want more information about getting to see the exhibition, you can check it out there. This program tonight is in collaboration with the Neighborhood Story Project. They've worked on the exhibition with us and with some of the related programming. We're so excited to be working with them. I just also wanna mention that the exhibition is de dedicated to the memory of Ronald Lewis and Sylvester Francis. We had a program a few weeks ago to honor them and talk about their incredible work that they did to preserve uh, the memory and the history of social aid and pleasure clubs and second lining parades. And so we just wanna say again that this is dedicated to them. Oh, yes, and I'm seeing right now, I'm seeing Dolores Sims pop up in the chat. And so that was the final thing I wanted to say. We're so excited to have all of you here with us tonight. You'll see the chat button down at the bottom there in the toolbar. If you wanna pop in and say hey and where you're tuning in from, we'd love to hear uh, <laughs> where you are right now. And you'll also see just a couple of uh, buttons over a Q&A button. At the end of the conversation, we're gonna open it up for questions from you. So if you want to ask a question of any of our speakers tonight, just go ahead and post in the Q&A right there. So I think that's all for me. I really wanna get the conversation started. So now I'm gonna turn it over to our moderator for tonight, Rachel Brenlin. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, welcome to everybody. Welcome to all of our panelists. Um, Yes, my name is Rachel Brenlin. I'm the uh, director of the Neighborhood Story Project, and I'm also a cultural anthropologist at the University of New Orleans um, and have been a working ethnographer for over 20 years in the city. And um, in our work with the Neighborhood Story Project, and even before when I was first just getting started in um, learning how to document the stories that are important in our city, um, I realized that Having important neighborhood anchors around neighborhoods uh, is a key part of what keeps our communities vibrant. Um, when I was uh, in graduate school, I did my project, first ever ethnographic project on a corner bar room in Treme called Joe's Cozy Corner, and um, did a life history project with Papa Joe Glasper, who um, was the bar owner at the time, but it had inherited it from another very famous bar owner named um, Mama Ruth and Ma Mama Ruth Queen. And um, I, I just wanted to read a little uh, excerpt from an interview that I did with Papa Joe years ago about the importance of these kinds of spaces. Um, he said to me a long time ago, anything you do, you gotta love what you do. I love what I do. And I love these young boys coming out here. Papa Joe, can we practice? Go on and practice. Papa Joe, we're gonna barbecue. Go on and do it. You come around here, Papa Joe, what you got? I got some beans back here. Yeah, you can have some. You got to do something for people. You can't just receive all the time. You have to give back. Come in and go out, just like breathing. You breathe in and you breathe out. And um, I, that idea of, the give and take and the call and response of places like um, the Young Men Olympia's uh, clubhouse in um, Central City, the Sportsman's Corner, also in Central City, um, Club Good Times in the um, Fifth Ward and um, Seals Class Act over in um, the Seventh Ward, just down the street from us are uh, wonderful examples of that kind of give and take that happens in communities um, around the city and how they're connected to the parading culture 
of New Orleans. Um, so we invited um, our guests tonight to just share their own experiences. Um, and we just wanna start with uh, Mr. Norman Dixon Jr. who is the president of the Young Men Olympia um, Benevolent Association. And um, his father, Norman Dixon Sr. has been really influential in the culture um, about keeping in the parades on the street, connecting social and pleasure clubs to um, Jazz Fest every year and building a, a network um, a, across the city with different clubs. Um, but the, uh, we also wanted to start with uh, the Young Men Olympia because it is one of the, it is the oldest benevolent association after the Firemen's Association. Um, and it has an amazing legacy. There's a lot of intrigue around it. The parade is enormous every year. And um, since right before Katrina, they ran their own space too. So I, I'm really excited to have Norman here. He's actually, um, we, we met um, through doing the interviews for um, the Dancing in the Streets exhibit. And you can hear more of his reflections in the audio guide of the exhibit. Um, Norman, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, it's just for people that don't know anything about the YMO, um, could you just give us a little background? Oh, well, the YMO, Young Men Olympics, was um, established um, in 1884 by some African Americans who were influ um, role models in the community, um, doctors, lawyers, musicians. Um, and what they did is they formed a benevolent organization in order to help um, people in the community. Um, at that time, African Americans couldn't um, have burial policies. Um, they didn't have a lot of money to see doctors. So what they did is they got together and they formed a benevolent association to just raise money to um, support those who are in need um, of being buried, um, being, um, having to go to the doctors and just came together and helped um, support those things. Um, and since that, um, we've been here um, doing the same thing. Um, now we're, we're still um, assisting um, members um, who family might struggle um, to bury them. Um, we still, we have two tombs that all members are allowed to go into. Um, and we do several things around the community right now. Our big project is um, during the pandemic, providing snacks and um, bags of food um, for families who kids were not able to go to school and were home all the time. And um, people don't realize how big of an um, extra expense that was. You know, you have your kid go to school, eat lunch there, and now they're home all day and kids tend to eat a lot. So we were excited about um, participating and providing that um, to the kids. When um, y'all were first being found, there were a number of musicians that were uh, kind of instrumental in getting y'all to think about doing parades in the, um, in the community. Yeah. Can you tell us yeah. how that came about? Um, what happened is uh, the first five, six years, the Young Men Olympics didn't have parades. We were basically about benevolence um, and helping the community, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, but we had a lot of musicians. And um, traditionally, when a musician died, um, they had a um, funeral procession, um, a jazz procession um, behind the body um, going to the graveyard. And it was passed by our organization that musicians who um, passed on um, was allowed to have those um, jazz processions behind a funeral of a member. Um, a lot of the other members became jealous, not jealous, but they wanted the same treatment. So what they did is um, the organization passed to where every um, member would get that. And the musicians who were a part of the band, I mean, a part of the organization, we're excited to participate and be able to, to uh, send off any um, member, whether they were in a band or not, as long as they were in the Young Middle Olympics. 
Um, so that's how we actually started parading. Um, lucky enough for years, um, had passed and didn't actually have anybody die. So they came together at a meeting and just asked could we have what we now call our annual parade. Um, and that's the big parade. Um, so we just carried on from then, um, just uh, continually having parades. Um, but I, I always tell our, our organization and they know the young men is um, first about um, benevolent and taking care of each other and helping as much as we can in the community. And second line in this, uh, you know, it's just a part of it, but it's the small part, believe it or not. Um, so you do the uh, you do the big parade, which I want to talk about in a minute. But you also do a small parade every year to honor yeah. the actual anniversary, where everybody comes together and wears the black and white, right? As your yeah. club. Um, that's our anniversary parade. That's to symbolize when the organization first was, was uh, established. Uh, we had that celebration. But the biggest thing that comes out of that besides the anniversary and seeing another year is from that time um, on to the year before, from the year before to then, uh, what we do is we, 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 uh, we remember those who have passed if anybody passed it. If you ever um, come to our anniversary parade, into our big parade, if you, we have two sides. A lot of people don't even notice. Uh, we have a blue side and a black side. If you see the black side at the anniversary of um, the big parade, the annual parade, if you see it on the black side, that means somebody had passed the year before. And usually on our parade um, route, we honor those by putting their names on that in memory of whoever might have passed. But that banner tells it all. If we're on the blue side, nobody passed, and we're happy. Um, and we're happy if, you know, because we understand that um, and everybody has to pass, but we um, have it on the black side, so. Um, and I, I know that a number of your members got very sick with COVID, but everybody has made it through, right? Yeah, um, we had six members, actually, all six were on life support. Um, at some point, and all six made it. And I, and I had, I made this big speech. You know, sometimes I can get emotional when it comes to this yeah. organization because it means so much to me. And I, and I actually told them, you know, after all the years of saying we're still an organization and we still have a brotherhood that does not rely or depend on having a second line, um, it really showed it. You know, it, it came the past that we had a year without second lining, but I've never over the 40, 47 years I've been in the organization, ever seen a closeness like uh, we had in this past year of coming together, supporting each other um, through, this, through, through this pandemic, so. Um, yeah, that's amazing. And you know, when, People have come to your y'all's big parade. They see, um, you know, y'all have many divisions. There's at least five divisions, right? Um, the six. And then the body is the six, or is the? Oh, it's the five. Well, uh, we count them all as together. Together, okay. But one of them is the body. <laughs> okay, can you just because I know if you, so how many members are there? In, in uh, right now, we have a total of 137. Last time we counted. Yeah. Last time I got a count. But actually it's crazy because we've been having people join during the pandemic. So uh, oh, yeah. they, during the pandemic, we might have about 12 or 13 more members. And that was surprising. But once again, um, it was good to see that because that right there told me that they were coming in because of the organization and not because of the second line. So. Mm -hmm. um, just for people who may decide to come to your parade for the first time when we can open the city back up. Could you explain how the body works and what, the other division so when they see it, they'll understand? Yeah, what happens is the body is, uh, we call it the body because that represents the organization. Um, that group would always have black and white. 
and anybody in our organization can parade in that group. Um, and I always say, and I tell them, sometimes <laughs> I get upset. All of these groups can go long as we keep the body. <laughs> so whenever um, everybody try to start doing their own thing and getting outside of our um, bylaws, um, it's like, hey, you know, you don't have to stay because <laughs> we can go with the body. Um, that's what we originally had. Um, one time, they actually had, um, I remember talking to older members, and they had one band, and they had like 78 people following one band. Um, and that's amazing. But yeah. that's what they knew at that time, you know, organization get one band. So now we're at, uh, we have six bands. We usually have the best six bands in the city. Um, but the body comes out first, they lead the parade and they represent the organization. And um, I was telling them, since I've been in here, I've been in eight different groups. Wow. And none of the groups that I actually parade with are in except the Untouchables, um, which I had the uh, honor of starting that division. But all of the other eight are gone. Only thing remains the same is the body. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge too that there's so many clubs that parade around the city that have grown from y'all, um, different branches. I was just thinking about Joe Black and um, Furious Five. Yeah, yeah. And Joe started. Black, um, yeah, he was with the Furious Five. We have nine time. Um, they came from the Young Men Olympics, even though they're in the night war. We have members from all over. Um, the original four, um, um, perfect gentlemen. All those guys used to parade with me when I was young, when I was young, <laughs> um, <laughs> decided to go on their own. And we're not mad. Uh, we enjoy them. They still support us. We support them whenever we can. Um, and still, because one thing is, is once you're a young men Olympics, you're always one. Can you tell us the story of how y'all decided to, to um, get your own space? Um, yeah. We, it really, it was really easy. Um, one day we were just in a meeting and um, us younger guys at that time, I was just coming out of college and we had a number of young people um, in. And we were like, man, how, why we keep meeting in these, uh, you know, we were meeting ballrooms, we were meeting um, gyms, local gyms, we were meeting halls. We used to um, rent the Elks. Um, you know, we originally started um, in a funeral home. Uh, mm -hmm. Gertrude Gettys, who was a great partner of ours because we we're benevolent and they were a funeral home. And every member, when I came up in the 70s and 80s, went to Gertrude Gettys. If somebody in the young men died, you know where their body was going to go through. And it's great because we still had that relationship with them. Every year they sent us street cars for our parade for free. And that's something, um, you know, um, the, the original owner um, had promised to do. Young as long as there was a young middle Olympics, Gertrude Gettys were going to supply cars. And so every year they give us street cars, you know, and just say, here, this is what we said. Um, but back to what you asked, <laughs> the story is we decided well, we, we went to a meeting and said, hey, but we just got our own building. And they were like, yeah, I guess, you know, it, it was no big thing. If y'all want a building, we'll get y'all a building. And, you know, and so I was going there basically thinking I was going to have to give this big long speech of why we need a building. <laughs> Trying to say, hey, we could afford it. And I had this financial report because I was the financial secretary at that time. And I was like, hey, we can easily afford a building. And they were like, oh, yeah, if y'all want a building. And after it was all said and done, I, I asked my father, I was like, why did y'all never have a building. It was like, we weren't worried about a building. Mm -hmm. We just wanted to come together and we, they enjoyed meeting at a bar or meeting at a clubhouse um, somewhere and just fellowship and not only with themselves, but with other people in the community. Mm -hmm. That was the big important thing to them. They never cared about basically saying we have our own building. It was so long they had the opportunity to come together. And one week, sometime we would be at this Bar and one week we might be at that bar, you know, but, you know, and I understood what he said after he told me, and I was like, yeah, we got everything we needed to do accomplished wherever we were. 
And the biggest accomplishment was coming together and enjoying each other. Because we would have meetings. If we had a meeting at a bar, shit, we, I remember I would leave my dad and them there. And they would be leaving there, get there at 12 o'clock and come home 9, 10 o'clock at night. I'm like, <laughs> but that was their way of coming together and fellowshipping. So. Um. Well, tonight we have Elwaz here from Sportsman's Corner, and um, I was wondering if you just, as kind of a, a, some last reflections, just want to talk about your relationship with, with their bar over the years. And yeah, uh, well, once again, through my father, I, I learned about um, Sportsman Corner. Um, his dad and my dad were real good friends, and he often talked about him, and I often found him around there um, at the bar, you know, having a drink fellowshipping with, you know, Steve's dad and other um, members of the young men. They, they love that club. And, and we still have a lot of members um, go there and, and, and it's always on our stop. It's always a stop. And he always welcomed us. Um, and um, uh, one of the people that I admired was my Miss Teresa who, who passed. And she always welcomed me. Uh, from the get-go, little Norman, that's what she called me. <laughs> so, and she always befriended me and asked me um, anytime I was there, if I needed something, how could she help? Um, and it's always been great. So we always had a relationship um, with each other. So it's great seeing yeah. him around. So I'm glad you, you had him on the show. <laughs> yeah, I know that you have other things going on this evening, but if uh, you wanna hang around, um, they're going to come up next, and then um, we'll circle back around for questions in a, in a while. We have um, Harry uh, Franklin from Keeping It Real and Club Good Times, too, and this field. Um, so yeah, and I I actually said his dad, that's his grandfather, who my dad was friends with. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and then there's three generations of the... Yeah. <laughs> um, well, th thank you so much, Norman. I really okay. appreciate it. Um, Thank you for having me again. Yeah, so um, thank y'all so much for being here. I would like to present um, Cesar and Stephen Elwa, who are part of this three generation lineage of, <laughs> of the Sportsman's Corner. I don't want to over talk and not give them the opportunity to tell their own stories. So um, we'll just get into it if that's okay. But the Sportsman's Corner, as um, Norman was saying, is an incredible institution um, that's been a huge anchor for Central City and really all over the city for um, generations. And I know it's hard to keep the space going um, and to fill it with life if um, you, you don't have like ongoing support from your community. And y'all have been able to do this from generation to generation. So I don't know, um, Caesar, if you wanted to begin by talking about the early days and then well the i think uh norman did a really good job of laying it out uh as he mentioned how people have reached out and helped one another how uh they helped bury people because my dad did the exact same thing it, 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 that evidently that was something that caught him mm -hmm. because there were quite a few people whose funerals my father paid for uh quite a few people whose electric bills he paid wow um, uh, there was one guy that spoke at his funeral, my father, talking about when he wanted to purchase a house. And my dad loaned him the money, but he never worried about getting it back. Wow. But that was that kind of, that's, that's that kind of community. And my stories come from people like Mom Boudreau and Bo Dallas, listening to, you know, as I listened to them, sat around and listened to them talk about how that corner was a, People's corner. That was the corner they met up in the mornings before they went to work. They all were like worked on the riverfront, they were paying us calls with school teachers. Mm -hmm. And during the days of my father, uh, that's who frequented that place. That's who was there all the time. Everybody had their own seat. And if you, me, if I walked in that door and I'm sitting in Particularly this guy McCullough, I was always in his seat. And nobody <laughs> told me I had nobody told me I had to get up. His seat was like right at the end. Nobody told me I had to get up. I just got up. Everybody had their own class with their name. <laughs> you know, this was a real community-based environment. Mm. Um, 
they they had their own games they played like they, they had what they call a crawl party uh and at the end of football season if you bet against the saints there was a red carpet on the floor you had to crawl all around that ball <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 what that, that's what it was like up then the the biggest thing about that area that i like is that everybody is somebody i mean you can see somebody you may to, and you I didn't may appear to be a bum. Mm -hmm. But if that person died, you're gonna see everybody in that neighborhood at that film. Mm -hmm. Everybody's mm -hmm. gonna celebrate that person's life. So, you know. And, and just you know, the complexity of their experiences and their family. Tell can you tell me a little bit about your, your dad and what made him decide to, to do the bar? My dad was a I don't want to use the term hustler. What, what would I call it? My dad worked, worked workaholic. Mm -hmm. My dad always had three jobs. He worked for Atlas Group and he come in the daytime. He called it the Sands Lounge. You might not know about the Sands Lounge. Where, where was the Sands Lounge? The Sands Lounge is where Takabaka is now. What is that, Jefferson Highway? Okay, yeah. That's where Frank Sinatra and all of us back in like 1963. Okay. And he'd bring us over. He was kind of father who drug his children with him everywhere he went. But uh, he used to bring us over. But anyway, he yeah. the, um deliver clothes in the evening. I mean, he just, he was the kind of guy every Friday, my mom would go to his job with her four children <laughs> and get his check and go straight to swag when we leave out with five or six baskets to go to that kind of guy. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, he, he just was a very giving kind of guy. He, he, people loved him and he loved them. And I still feel that vibe. I particularly get excited when I see some of the old, old timers come around yeah, I gotta go shake the hand and I gotta go hug them and they come hug me, you know. And it's just it's just the warmest feeling you could ever imagine. So he 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 kind of um, you know he he again Norman laid it out. I mean, yeah. he laid it out because my dad was just a continuation of that. Did your dad ever talk about bars that were important to him before he had his own, or um, there was a bar I'm told. But I don't remember. They say he worked at a ball, but I've been very close to my father since birth, and I don't remember him working at a ball. But there are people who say that he's worked at some other ball. But okay. that couldn't have been too long. Yeah, he so just decided to go on his own. He decided that he wanted to do that. And he got lucky because um, the, the building caught fire. Now, this here's an example of the love in that community. The building caught fire. Um, what's his name? Blake Thrones with Bodiles? Nick. Nick was, was well, he played with, um, yeah, with Bodiles. He was a drum. Mm -hmm. Nick was a carpenter. Nick got together with some more guys around there. They put a new roof on that place. Oh, wow. My uncle put a new bar in it, and it's been history ever since. Wow, that's amazing. But when, when the place caught fire, the guy, my daddy offered him money for it. The man took the money, and the place was in here ever since. But the thing is, the people in that community just who pull out the hammers and nail and got together and, and, and did what they did. That's why when Nick come to there, he can't buy nothing. Not if I'm there. Yeah. Did he can't he, spend a quarter. What year was that? So oh, man. Happened. You know, time go by so fast and that my age, things start to get fed. But it's been a long okay. time. since maybe in the late 70s or something. Okay. Somewhere yeah. around that time. Um, yeah, like years ago, we I worked on a project called Cornerstones, which was about important community anchors around the city, and the Sportsman's Corner was uh, one of the, the places. And um, we did a little interview with Alfred Bucket Carter, um, who always saw the Sportsman as his, one of his home bases. I don't know if he wanted to say anything. They all, they all, they all. When, I remember when Mom made, what, the 70s? They wanted Monk to do his party by Tipitina's or the House of Blues or one of them. Mm -hmm. Monk said, I'm doing my party on Second Drive when all my friends can come. Yeah. So Teresa, my sister Teresa, who was the second generation owner of that, of that business, mm -hmm. my sister Teresa took these big balloons. Each letter was about this big. Wow. And she put Monk across the top of the building. We, I still got the pitch. We had a hell of a time. <laughs> you, your sister was known for her. Oh, um, Teresa was. Very talented. Yeah, her balloon. I would, it's, would you call it balloon art? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she, she just 
created a lot of the stuff that she did. I mean, she started that massage thing, but 30 years ago, they were little children. Mm -hmm. And that's how she kept them out of trouble. She had all them going to deliver balloons. They all knew how to do it. She taught them all how to do it. <laughs> they all know how to do the same thing you see her do. Yeah. do. Mm -hmm. And his brother can do it. And all the little friends, about 12 or 13 little boys, and they, every one of them, she would send them, Miseo can verify, she would send out, bring stuff, you know, that they would do work that they had done. Wow. So, you know. You delivered things too. Yeah, I'm delivering. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. She's right about that. I'm delivering, man. Um, and when did Teresa take over the, the bar? Well, during Katrina, my father got sick, and she was busy dealing with him. I mean, Teresa brought him every single place she went. I mean, I I could not believe how this girl just gave up her whole self, you know, for my dad the way she did. I've never seen anybody do anything like that, but he had just started working with my dad. My okay. dad started teaching him the business before, right before he got sick. And he's, he was in there long enough to learn. It. When he first got in there, the first week he got in there with my dad, my dad didn't have to do nothing. He'd sit there, eat peanuts and drink coke. <laughs> he didn't have to do nothing. Mm -hmm. And it just was fortunate that when he got ill, he was just able to just take over. Yeah. Um, and I don't know how much you, I know it might be emotional, but um, just have any tributes to your, your sister and because she, um, for those who don't know, she passed away from coronavirus very early on in the pandemic, um, which was a, a huge loss for y'all's family and, and the community. Um, I don't know if you, if you want to say. Well, my tribute is to keep an eye on her sons. Mm -hmm. and her grandsons. That's my truth. Yeah. And um, so you're still spending a lot of time over by the bar and... I'm, 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 I've been with them since they were born and I'm still with them and probably gonna be with them to the last minute. Yeah. Yeah, just to reflect some things on them. Yeah. Uh, at the funeral, uh, one of the dedications I had to her um, with the fact, like my aunt had said about uh, us, her teaching us things, uh, that, that really never dawned on me that, that I would be able to create was one of the cassages that I actually made myself um, wore to the funeral mm -hmm. in honor of her that I actually sit down and made and put together myself. I've never actually, I've always watched. I've always delivered to different, you know, people in the city, like a lot of people in the city, um, but never actually put one together. And I was actually able to sit there and, and take my time and put together one in honor of her over the memories of seeing her doing wow. different things for people. And, and I, you know, I actually did a good job and, and mm -hmm. you know, and put all my blessings into it in order to have that death, and uh, wear that death to the funeral for her, you know, and those are some of the things that, you know, will go along with it, you know, and I, uh, I, I was just wondering if, like, the way you were making it, if you could see her hands making it. Pretty much. And, and to, to, to think about it, it, it all just came to me when actually I had never created one before. Like I said, I've always watched, I've always delivered for her, uh, always, you know, did other things that she was involved with it for decorating other venues, other bars, other halls, um, sales class at, uh, uh, just a lot of other numerous places in the city, you know, preferably maybe 80% of the, the, the bars that are in Central City, in New Orleans. Um, and it was just one of those things that just came to me. Yeah. And, and, and I 
So, yeah, I, I, I want to say that she had a hand on me in doing that. Yes. For you, what, what has it been like to, um, what was it like to see your grandfather running a space what, that was so important to so many and then just, you know, to be doing this with Caesar and your mom and the rest of your family? Well, from from the beginning, I, I never actually uh, seen myself as being uh, in a bar, operating a bar. I always uh, looked at it as I was helping, you know, and, and, and I, I was giving my best, you know. Coming up, I, I, I drove trucks and I did numerous other little things, and, and that was the direction that I was heading. But, you know, in life, you know, it takes you different places, and, and I found myself coming up underneath him, uh, keeping that business alive, you know, which which I, I enjoy doing, and, and, you know, and keeping his legacy going on, you know, and, and that, that was one of the things that I found actually was big behind to keeping that going, and, and I'm just glad that, you know, I'm here today and I'm, I'm able to go on in the third generation in order to keep the business afloat and keep it going. Tell us what it's like to um, host a parade because y'all host so many throughout the year. It actually, it, it, it's, it's, it's time consuming. You would think you would just go there and open up the doors. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot of um, pre, pre, uh, uh, just getting things together beforehand. You know, you just got to uh, get there and, and, and uh, have things in order because there's a lot to it. It's, it's, it's not just, you know, I'm there and I'm doing this. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of food out. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just a lot of added extra wages. Correct. Mm -hmm. Order more for the right. guys to buy clean up with his old. Right, right. <laughs> and then you just have to oversee a lot and, and preparations for what's going on. And, you know, after doing it so long, it, it, it becomes a, a natural, a, a normal thing. And people think it looks easy because, you know, I'm just there and I'm, I'm looking around. You're but, looking calm. Right, right. <laughs> but it's a lot of preparations beforehand that you got to get together in order to make things work. You know, and, and and I'm glad that I was able to to get that experience from working with my grandfather, from working with my mom, and in and, and order to be able to uh, keep things going. The other time of year that I thought um, people would want to hear about is um, Carnival Day. You know, it, um, it, that is an amazing celebration as well. That, that that's a big old. Uh, <laughs> Preparation too. Uh, basically, for for me, that's that's like a like an all nighter. You know, basically, I I'll be sleeping at oh, like two days. Right, right. right. And uh, so the Indians are sewing the last parts of their suit, and y'all are like doing the all nighters as well. Right, and, and and a lot of it got a lot to do with preparation for that being there for them because they may have to come in and and bring somebody. Uh, soups in throughout the night in order for them to, to, to prep what they got going. So, you know, it's a lot of work and there's a lot of teamwork and, and you know, basically after doing it so long, it, it becomes a normal, but it, it's, it's a lot of preparation for that. So, um, tell us what tribes come out of your space. Um, we got all kinds of different tribes. One of the major ones was the Wild McMillions that was uh, actually a uh, Found it, and uh, they actually are uh, um, one of the one of the biggest uh, uptown Central City area, and uh, a bunch of other ones, but mainly um, that one in particular. But they all come together. And meet there. Correct. And do y'all do Indian practices too, or is it usually down the street? Well, the um. Uh, we, we do hosting um, ever since uh, this COVID and everything been going on. Things been kind of slow mm -hmm. because of what's, what's happening. And uh, 
at, at some point we'll go back to that. But yes, uh, we do host them uh, down the street, host them. Our whole neighborhood community come together. In, in the okay. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us this evening around it. I know that people are going to want to ask you questions during the question and answer session. Um, and y'all, this is a very wonderful place to spend the evening at the Sportsman's Corner or on a Sunday afternoon um, when the parades are coming by or just when you want to hang out with your friends. <laughs> um, thank you very, very much. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Oh, wait, we should read the, the passage, huh? I'm, I'm sorry. So we, um, when we were doing the Cornerstones book, um, we did an interview with Teresa, so we thought we would just read a little bit in her own voice. This is, I don't know if y'all can see a photo of her. And you know what? The story is is the same because she basically said the same thing I said. But, but, <laughs> her, but her words are, we have a lot of meetings here with the different clubs. We always open up the space to different organizations. Let them use the kitchen and, and let them use the kitchen in the back. The way my daddy was with customers, if they needed something from him in any kind of way, he'd be there for them. He was a real father figure to a lot of people, a lot of guys. Yeah, that's Mr. Lou. What she mean by that is he was Mr. Lou to everybody. <laughs> Mr. Lou, Mr. Lou. Um, Daddy had one, yeah, my father had one stroke after Katrina and another one after Rita. So since then, I took care of him and Stephen's been running the ball. Before the hurricane, he was helping his grandfather. So he had learned the whole business. So he'd already learned the business. And she basically said the same thing I see. Because the story is one, one story. story. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I hope. Y'all have an amazing tribute to her this evening, and um, I feel very fortunate to have gotten a chance to meet her as well. And um, we'll, we're going to invite um, Harry from Club Good Times, too, and the president of Keeping It Real, who grew up in the Magnolia Project and um, paraded uptown for years with the revolution before he started his own group. So Miss L. Wise from Miss Teresa, she was um, decorating a lot of um, social and pleasure clubs at the time, and I met her through the revolution, and um, she did a lot of her own setup for me to take pictures. Okay, wow. And so, so Perry was a, a professional photographer for a number of years as well. Do you, um, do you want to say anything about watching him? Yes, he's a little man. He is. <laughs> he is there. He is there all the time. I mean, the no, no hats. Did it all for him. That's awesome. Yes, indeed. What an amazing business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. New Orleans aesthetics is just like, you know, you go around the world and you realize how incredible our creativity is here. Right. And you know, it's just like what Stephen was saying around the passages, like it, because it's like learning by doing all the time, you know, people don't even realize how incredible the creativity is. So you grew up with a bar room as well. Yes. <laughs> Do you want to tell us about y'all's bar room? Yes, Club Good Time One was on Roman and Daniel. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, um, it was your uncle's bar. It was my uncle's bar, then it became my mother's bar. Okay, so tell us what it what it was like over there. Over there, we used to hold the Indian practice for Big Roddy from out to Cali, mm -hmm. and we had a lot of second line came through there, and other fellas came through. A lot of Indians came through. Mm -hmm. And um, when did your when was your uncle running it, and when did they transition to your mom? Over in the eighties, we got into my mom's in the nineties. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, tell us just to to backtrack a little bit. Um, you grew up in the Magnolia. Yes, early sir. in life. Yes, I grew up on Belmont and Magnolia. In Magnolia, not too far from Big Chief O'Dollar. 
And so you re you remember all the corner bar rooms and stuff that yes. were going on in Central yes. City. Yes, Brown Derby's, the Rolling Twelve. <laughs> yes. From an early age, you were dapper dresser. No. 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 When did you start to get interested in the fashion? Fashion came once I started dealing with the second line social mm -hmm. club clubs. And so what was the club that you first were connected to? Okay, when I first started off, my AT put me in uh, a Mason's. Oh, yes. The Mason's. I was like eight years old in the Mason's club. Will you tell the story? Because it's an amazing story. Well, I never, <laughs> ever understood it, but when she put me in it, we started a parade and I was going up the street. So when I heard the music, I tried to move a little and people started grabbing me, told me I couldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't understand at the time why I can't do that. So to explain it to me. <laughs> uh, your friends were calling your name and they were expecting you to yes. do something. Yeah, they were expecting me to cut up, you know. And so I tried to cut up, but they wouldn't let me. So I started crying and everything. So I <laughs> found out why I couldn't dance. It was Eastern Star. Yes, Eastern Star. <laughs> Slightly different. Uh, still a brass band, but. Yes, it's much yeah. different than a set. No chance. How, um, how did you get connected with the revolution? Um, after um, I left the Miller Fellas, I went to the revolution. Okay. And I like what they was doing so far. It was downtown at the night at the time. And they had just left from uptown with the YMO. Mm -hmm. So I wound up joining the new club that was getting out on their own. And they and you stayed how many years did you stay with? Ten them? years. Yeah, so a whole decade. Yeah. Um when did so at, at that time your mom was running club good times still and cooking and Right, cooking and everything for, and she was the ball maid too at the time. Okay. So that when she wound up taking over, she became the ball owner. Okay. And then when did you acquire your bar? Um, I acquired my bar in 2000. Okay. 2000. And what was, tell us some of the reasons why you decided. I wanted to live my mom's memory, so mm -hmm. I named the club with time too. Thank God, it made me good ever since. Um, so this, so the, the original one was on Thalia, you were saying? Yes, on Thalia and uh, on. Uh, and this one is downtown. Downtown or Canton Duke. My, um, my favorite memories of Club Good Times after the storm was um, the Hadi Press. <laughs> yes. Uh, mm. What night did you, was it Thursday night? It was Sunday night. Sunday night, okay. Yeah. yeah, I had some wonderful evenings there. And I was wondering if you could just talk about your relationship with Benny, who's the leader, Benny P, the leader of the Hadi, and how y'all, you know, collaborated over the years. Yes, I met the Hadi when I became the CEO of um, Keaton and Real Associates Club, and they were the first band that started with us. And um, we used to be uptown around a lot, around 2nd and D, and around the corner by Bean's brother a lot, you know, and we did a couple of videos together. And I used to work with Janeiro on the river front. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in the exhibit, there's this beautiful photo of y'all, um, I think you're on Broad Street? Broad and Dooney. Broad and Dooney. Um, for, do you want to talk a little bit about the tribute that you do for De Niro every yes. year? Every year we do a tribute for um, the Heidi Bain and Janelle Schaefer Foundation on Broad and Do Man. You know, trying to memorize his memories, you know, before his, he was murdered on that street. Yeah. De Niro was, um, he was an amazing person. He had, um, had become the band director at Rob Wayne for a few years. And after Katrina, you know, a lot of the band programs had broken up. It wasn't, especially the middle school programs were not coming back together the way that they had been before, which were the, you know, they taught music in middle school. And then when you got to high school, you'd be playing at kind of a high level. Um, and after 
Katrina that um, that system broke down and De Niro was really interested in like trying to make sure that the kids could really learn to play music. Uh, at the Neighborhood Story Project was still at John Mack at the time and De Niro's uh, son, stepson went to John Mack, but there was all kinds of, um, you know, negative things happening around young people not being in school, not being with their families because of all the displacement and um, De Niro was, um, someone was shooting at De Niro's stepson and they shot him instead, which was extremely devastating for everybody. But I, like when that tribute that y'all do is amazing. Yeah. You don't miss the year door. Yeah. You miss the year door. What is some of the, what are some of your favorite parts about running your own club um, as a second line club and then also as a bar owner? It won't be, remember, I try to make sure everybody happy so I keep everything in line. So it's, you know, the second line and, and the bar, you know, mm -hmm. and make sure everybody be treated fair. That's why I named Keeping It Real, so we can keep it real. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and y'all, um, you don't begin at the club, but you end there, right? Yes, we begin there. We start on the Bayou, ate up. Ernie Street to Broad Street, make our way to the barber shop, the Avenue Barber Shop. We leave the Avenue Barber Shop and go to Sears Class Act on St. Bernard. Mm -hmm. And we the do main game now. And once we leave there, we go up the street to Victor's. Mm -hmm. And we leave Victor's, we go to Joker Polka on Ernie Street. Then we go back home to Club Good Time. Um. And since we have Ms. Beal here this evening, I was wondering if you could talk about um, her space a little bit. Yes, this says it's a class act. <laughs> like the name says it's a class act. I met a long time ago and I like to go to the ball because they have live entertainment and everything. And I bring my wife and my family and we have a good time all the time. Yeah, it reminds us. Um, and she uh, she hosts many, many stops throughout many, the year. Many, many stops. They got to go down safe and all the <laughs> got it. You ain't in the house, you ain't got to pass. <laughs> it. That's what it happens. Um, could you talk a little bit about one of the things we haven't touched upon is the um, kind of relationship between the clubs and how y'all support each other. So you're saying that the Domain Gang hosts that stop. Can you explain to people who may not know what that means. Yes, in, in, in the second line world, we all want big family to where we try to embrace everyone, you know, and the older clubs, you learn a lot from them and, you know, you be able to, you know, strive off of what they did to make it, you know, to be so older, but everybody, we get along pretty good in the second line. It's yeah. a good thing to be in. So you, so the domain gang, Posts a, a stop for you, meaning that they, they give out the food and the. Yes, they give out food and water. Right mm -hmm. about Sears Glass Act for us. They do it for a lot of different clubs. Yeah, when I did the interview with Byron, who's the president of um, Domain Game, he said that they do maybe 14 stops a year, yes, yes. Uh, both uptown and downtown. Mm -hmm. Well, I've done stops here before, and it's a lot of work to prepare for it. Like, the right. Elwaz were saying, like, you have to, it's not like you can just run to the store a few minutes beforehand. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, well, are there any uh, favorite memories that you want to share? With yes. Our yes. Okay. Um, I think when we came back from Katrina, you know, that was one hour year that we thought we wasn't going to be able to make it, but we did make it. And thank God we made it. Yeah. Everybody was safe and happy. We made it back to New Orleans. I was reflecting on how after Katrina, one of the things that even though everybody had gone through such a difficult time, and a lot of people had lost people in the storm, you, we were able to be close together and that felt good. And with COVID, we haven't been able to do that as a way of, you know, it's like we've all had to be separate from each other for a year. Um, how has that been for your bar? I know that you've um, been doing a lot of food and um, cooking. Right, we've been doing a lot of cooking outside, thank God, and give us the strength to do it. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's keeping us afloat, you know, keeping us together. And with the second line, you know, a lot of the 
different clubs come around and show you love and appreciation and, and keep you rolling. So tell us, just for people who want to come support the space, tell us the nights that you have. On Wednesday night, we do steaks and chalk grilled oysters. And on Sunday night, we do steaks and grilled chalk grilled oysters. Char grilled oysters. Yes. Delicious. <laughs> Well, we have one more um, guest this evening, who is um, Cecile Dalton, uh, um, who everybody refers to as Cecile, and um, she's my neighbor down the street. And so um, I'm so happy that we've had this great overlap between everybody's stories. It really shows, like Gary was just saying, the interconnectedness of um, the community and what makes uh, it so special to be together uh, basically every Sunday. Um, Sunday is always a special, it has a special feel in the city. It's, you know, all around America, people are getting ready for work. And here we're like, we have this day where people are out and about together. Um, so Carrie, thank you very, very much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I, I love having you over here. Um, yeah, so y'all, I'm so happy um, to have, Nasil with us this evening. She runs an incredible space on St. Bernard Avenue that's been at the hub of Second Line Parades, but also live music and entertainment um, for a very long time. And oh, thanks for being here with us. Oh, thanks for inviting me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm glad that you're, you get to be over here in this space. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Another little corner space. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, could you just tell us a little bit about your um, your background, like how you got interested in parades and live music and hosting? Okay, you're a fabulous host. Thank you. Um, by being in the bar business, um, I was living in Baton Rouge, and my uncle offered me his bar. Married and living in Baton Rouge, three kids. I said, "I smiled. I said, my husband is not gonna let me run no bar." <laughs> and then I'm living way in Baton Rouge, and constantly have to commute. And um, I went home and I asked my husband and he said, um, as long as you have my kids back here on a Monday morning for school, you could try it. He said, knowing you, you probably do good. So I tried it. And here I am. Wow. <laughs> yes. 24 years later. Did you grow up in Baton Rouge? I, no, I grew up in New Orleans okay. um, in the Seven Water. I'm from the Seven Water. My husband's job transferred us to Baton Rouge. Okay. Yeah. Well, what does he do? Um, he's retired now. He was working at a chemical plant. Okay. For Chevron. Um, so when you were growing up, did you go to the parades and I love the parades. I love the Indians, yes. And um I just never dream I'd be in a bar business, but um then I started parading. I first started parading with um it was called Lady Sequence. Okay. And then I branched out on my own and it was called the Data Dogs. The Data Dogs? Yeah. Uh-huh, yes. And then that's when I started the bar. Yeah. So um, where, where was the first bar? My first bar was at the Bonton on uh, Florida Avenue. Okay. Yeah. Back in the Seven Ward. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and that was the bar that your father, uncle, your uncle gave you? Uh-huh, the Bonton, yes. Okay. Um, and what, and you, and you were doing the, the social club at the same time? I was time. in the social club at the same time. And then um, later I moved up to Seven on a Miro in 2000. And I also moved on Orleans and Dirigual. Um, I had a restaurant called Seals Out of It, oh, on yeah. called Orleans and um, Dirigual. And then I opened up another spot on um, Basin Street. And then yeah. um, after Katrina came, Katrina took all three. And um, I was able to sell Orleans and Dirigual. And then I came back and I rebuilt on St. Bernard. Right. Yeah. So you own the building on Sanford. I own the building on San Bernardo, yes. It's, um, how, how soon did you start hosting Second Line Parades? Um, like back, well, since I moved on San Bernardo. Yeah. Yeah, back in 2000. I was, the first one was on um, the Main Street Gang. I was um, friends with a whole lot of the older ones. Okay, yeah. And um, I was the very first boy that opened up to the Main Street Gang. Yeah. And Dubang Street Gang was the first one. 
that they were telling me during their interview that really your space was like their grand finale, even though they do head back to the sixth ward afterwards. Yes, like, uh -huh. <laughs> a lot of people don't ever leave. So yes. <laughs> yes. But I was the first one who opened up the doors for them. Mm -hmm. So they always stay by me longer. Yeah. 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 And who else comes by you? Um, I have um all the new style fellas. Um, I have keeping it real. Um these are the group from the night war. Um CT Steffers. Yeah, Revolution. Uh yes. Um it's so many of them. Um the ones from um Mm -hmm. They're from out of the Sixth War too. Black Men of Labor comes by. Did you say that already? Yeah, Black Men of Labor. I'm sorry. Yeah, Mr. Yeah. Ben and Young. Yes, they do. And Benny plays at, has played at your bar. Yes, all the time. Yes, a tremendous brass band, Mr. Benny Jones. Dear, dear friend. <laughs> yes. Um, I I know Benny has this kind of tradition of like spending time in a bar and playing music and yes. kind of developing a scene around. He's a regular. <laughs> <laughs> He's a regular. I buy his own special kind of be like the little $7 Bud Light. <laughs> you get that. So I have to make sure I have that for Mr. Betty, yes. <laughs> yes. And also I host the, uh, the Red Bean Club. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I and, host them every year. And they do, uh, they're, they've been doing something with supporting bar rooms. The local bars, yes, ma'am. They were, um, um supporting a lot of a lot of us um trying to keep the bars open mm -hmm. yes and they were giving our grants yeah that's great yeah it was awesome it really was how is it i know that things are kind of back up and running now but you had um quite a long time probably the longest since you started yeah when it was closed or yeah something. it just wasn't feasible for me to open because my space where I didn't open up the backboard. I have a pool in the backboard and it opened um because it was only like 25% mm -hmm. capacity that you could open. So I choose not to open. And um I just reopened back up and business is great. Yeah. It truly is. It's great. Yeah. What are some of the other um kinds of live music that you or live entertainment that you have? I have um live music. Um well I was having it every Friday and Sunday night, but I'm just starting back this coming Friday uh, with the live music. Okay. Yeah. Who's gonna be there? Um, it's gonna be in tune. Um, Brad. Um, oh Lord, in tune or a B band from out of Baton Rouge. Oh, cool. Yeah, nice. it's gonna start at eight o'clock. Um, how how do you feel like you've been able to manage for so long? Like, what keeps you inspired to continue your space? My customers, and then um, uh, I love people. Yeah. yeah, my customers, you know, call them, when are you going to open up the bar? When is the bar coming back? Yeah. 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 And then the kids. I love children. I love doing things for the kids in the community. You, I know that you do an Easter um, yeah, parade. Yeah, Easter every parade every year. We weren't able to do it um, in um, 2020 and again this year. We're looking forward to doing it next year. Tell, tell us about the, um, the parade. Do you uh -huh. give out the, the Easter eggs? Yes, ma'am. I've been doing it for um, 21 years, the Easter Parade for the kids in the community. And um, all the kids are king and queens. We ride on floats, we ride on the back of convertibles, and we throw Easter candy and stuffed animals. And the kids just have a good time. And they range from age two to like 18. Wow. And everybody's a king and everybody's a queen. <laughs> That's awesome. They yes. all remember that forever. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> yes, yes. Um. I, what are some other highlights for you that you'd like to share? About? I would like to share um, Corona. I had never been through something that horrible in my life. Um, back in December, I had a cruise. I give a cruise every year for my customers. And we went on the cruise and um, we came back sick. Majority of us, a lot of us came back sick. Thank you, we had a cold or the flu. And I went from like December, we got back like maybe the 19th of December, Christmas, I couldn't get out the bed. I was just really feeling bad. Mm -hmm. So the next week I felt a little better, got out, went to work and kept doing it. We're back in bed, get up, feel a little better. So finally I got so sick that I just, I couldn't get up. And that was back in the beginning of, well, the, right after Mardi Gras. I didn't even do Mardi Gras because I was sick again. And, um, 
I'm saying, you need to go to the, you need to go to the doctor. So I was just taking like over the counter remedies. So I went to the doc. I was on my way to the doctor. Well, I called my good girlfriend, which is Teresa Elwood, his mother, because oh. she had been sick too. We both thinking we had the flu. So um, I had called. I said, Teresa, I'm gonna go to the doctor. She said, Well, still, I'm gonna go too. I said, Well, I'm gonna get Debbie to pick me up. She's gonna pick you up. She said, No, I'm wait for my son to pick me. You just go ahead. She's coming back. She said, Look. Well, I told her I couldn't walk. I couldn't breathe. So I'm having my son bring you my wheelchair. I said, well, Teresa, if you bring me the wheelchair, how the hell is you going to get that? So I said, don't worry about bringing no wheelchair. So I'm going to go. So I'm away going to the doctor. I couldn't breathe. So I'm rolling down the window trying to get the fresh air. I told her, I said, don't bring me to the doctor. Bring me to the emergency room. So for, I, was, I was admitted. And I stood there for eight days. And at the time, I went in that Friday. And then Teresa's brother sees her. My phone rang like 3.30 in the morning. And um, I told the nurse, I trust the boy, I said, my cell phone is running. She said, well, you're in the hospital. I said, ma'am, I have to get that call. I run the bar. Something was yeah. happening. They're calling me 3.30 in the morning. And it was Caesar telling me that Teresa was sick. They were bringing them to the emergency room. And I said, well, just call me and make sure. And um, I came home. She didn't. And when I, took, I think about her trying to help me, and she was sicker than me. And when I tell you it was my dear, dear friend, she did all my cassages, all my balloons, and on that just pick up the phone, and it could be the last minute, Teresa, I need this. I'm on my way. I christened my grandson last week, and as I was going to the church, I seen a white van, and I said, oh, Lord, y'all look at Teresa. Yeah. I said, yes, Cecilia, but because I known her to be right there, and when I'm telling you that white van was parked right there, I said, oh, Lord, y'all look at Teresa. I got so excited. And I just wanted to share that. I mean, I love you, Stephen, and Lord, do I miss her. And she was such a, a icon in the community. Teresa helped everybody. Everybody. I mean, for nothing. <laughs> Teresa. Let's yeah. call Teresa. Teresa was there. Yeah. Um, I'm so sorry. Yeah. yeah. And did um are the other people that you went on that cruise with, are they all all right? No, two other ones passed also. Oh, wow. Yeah, two of them passed also. Again, we thought we had the, the flu. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was so fresh back then, they really didn't know what nobody had or was going to, because they didn't even know the treaters. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't know the treaters. I remember um, the Tamara Jackson from the VIP yes. days uh -huh. said that um, when the when they, they had gone to Sportsman's Corner before, like a week before, um, like when we didn't really know that this mm -hmm. it was happening and that a lot of the um, members when they went inside had gotten sick. And it just shows you how vulnerable y'all were as, mm -hmm. as you know, the owners of these beautiful spaces, but, you know. And it was so many ball owners that were sick and after I hear I say, oh my God, well, is it a ball owner sickness that's going around? Because it was, Looked like every time you would talk to somebody, a boner was sick. It was me, it was Stephen, it was um, Frank Charles with Silkies. Yeah. It was um, um, the candle woman who ran the candle. The ran, oh, candle, uh, the candlelight. Um, it was um, Oscar with Hanks. It was Bertha's. Um, it was um, Victor with the other place. It was a whole lot of boner. I could say, Lord Jesus, is it a boner sickness? But I must have had maybe like. 10 customers that passed. Oh, wow. And I had like 10. I'm so sorry. And so this had been a trying time, Katrina. I mean, for real, I mean. I say the same this. thing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I said, oh, it's been saying um, before Katrina. Yes, yes. But yeah. it, but I mean, it's COVID, but it has that same kind yes, of trauma. Yes, yeah. it. it's worse. Yeah. It was worse, yeah. 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 But just around like that, no intimacy. No, no. and then a whole year. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's slow, it's coming back. Yeah. You know, you can see a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. There. Yeah. <laughs> um, is Daryl outside? Because I would love for y'all yeah. to just say he was. To, it's I don't know if it's still <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, so, nice. so beautiful. Yes. And I'm, I, I um I knew I didn't know that you were in Teresa was super close, but I'm so glad that we had the opportunity. Teresa, yeah, yeah, best friend. Yeah, <laughs> and knew how I met her. I went into a drugstore, and this lady was working there, and she was making a massage. I just sat in the bar and I said, "Man, that's beautiful." 
So you make me want to, she said, sure. And sure enough, uh, she was working. She said, I'm going to leave it at my house. Gave me her address. And when I went, he was a little boy, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> and I knocked on the door. And sure he said, I said, I'm, I'm going to steal. Your mother left some meat and gave it a bag. And yeah, it's yeah. Her. Mm-hmm. So she's working at Edgar Drug Store. Wow. Yes. <laughs> um. Well, I'm not sure if, if Daryl's still there, but if he, he was, was yes, yeah, yes, okay. So we was. can. Is, is there anything else? Maybe we'll ask see if there's um, a question while we're waiting for him. Is there any? Hey, hi, hi, <laughs> oh, hi, hi. So, uh, thank y'all so much. This has been such an amazing conversation. We have just a couple of questions while we're seeing if Daryl is available. Uh, the first one's actually a comment. It's from a gentleman named Rick Weil, and he uh, he's at LSU in the sociology department. He just wants to say hi to Daryl and Norman. So, <laughs> so, a sh- <laughs> so a shout out to them. Um, um, somebody here in the chat is asking if uh, the recording is going to be available. Thank you for these beautiful inter- interviews. That's Rachel is asking that. Yes, we will be making this available on our HNOC's YouTube page. So give us a couple of days to get it up there, but check back. Um, and we have another question about that Cornerstones book, Rachel. Um, Tara is asking if where that book is available. Well, you can get it on our website. You can get all of the Neighbors Story Project books. Um, there's a little bookstore that um, you can order directly and we'll mail it out to you. And that's neighborhoodstoryproject.org? Yeah. Perfect. I'll put it here in the chat for everyone. Um, do we know if Daryl is going to be joining us tonight? We, he may have passed by and we've um, and continued on. Well, one of the reasons why we were excited to have um, Daryl and Seal together was because they're very close friends. And that's coming in. Um, and I was their queen in 2002. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. I was yeah. their queen in 2002. And he said that he knew y- you from the Nakumbra. And I forgot. I paraded was... with them also. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. A... I was their queen also. The Main Street Gang Queen. Nine times queen. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just thought it would be cool if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, our topic tonight is showing love and um, we've had all these amazing bar owners here, but I thought it would be also cool if you could just talk about the importance of musicians um, and because I've seen you over and over and over again show up for your friends at different parts of their life. Greg Mm -hmm. is an amazing trumpet player who performs all over the world, but Anytime someone close to him. Yeah, it's been a pretty much tough year, which in the last 11, 12 months. I've lost about maybe six friends, and they only maybe two of the six uh, that was related to COVID. But it was kind of tough on me because um, they were all very close friends, and two of them were very close musician friends of mine, Lucian Barberin and uh, Big Al Carson. So you grew up with since I'm a young boy, huh? Uh, yes, Lucian and I have been very close friends since we were teenagers. And so we were also members of Danny Walker's Fairview Baptist Church Band. And so we pretty much understood the importance of us preserving the ritualistic aspect of doing New Orleans Jazz funeral. So when he found out that he had cancer, he knows that I'm a very traditionalist person and he knew it was getting time, it was getting short for him. He said to his wife, if anything happens to me, I want to, I want you to make sure that Greg 
handles the funeral with the musicians for the jazz funeral. And that's something that I'm very much commonly known for doing, for stepping forward and make sure that a musician gets his proper send off in a traditional way. I did it with Danny Barker, did it with a few other musicians, uh, Louis Barbering. And so that particular day was a very uh, strong presence of a lot of musicians. and. We gave him his props and we did it in a manner in which he wanted it done. Now, there were two other people who were very close classmates of mine. And this year makes my 50th year reunion in my high school class. So these were two classmates of mine that within the last six months, I had to speak at their funeral you know, talk about how close we were as personal friends. And the last one was just about maybe four weeks ago. So it's very important that um, when you go through life and you meet people that have shared times with you and uh, they have had an impact on you and you've had moments of laughter and joy, uh, sometimes you have to step forward and gives strength to the family because everybody has a different way of approaching uh, debt and dealing with debt. And, um, so I am uh, very grateful and happy that I'm able to sometimes come forward and be a pillar of strength for my friends, family members. And, but uh, at the same time, um, I'm preparing for this 50 year reunion and these two individuals that were my class, they, they were looking so forward to being a part of this 50 year celebration. So as we move forward, um, I know that um, it's a special place for me uh, in New Orleans in terms of making sure that the tradition, uh, traditional Bible style, traditional brass band style music in this original state he carried on. And so that's one of my personal objectives as a musician is to carry on in the tradition of the traditional New Orleans jazz brass bands. They said that I am the leader of the Young Tuxedo Brass Band, a band that I inherited the leadership because at a very young age, I worked with a lot of legendary musicians who felt as though that I was the person that would really carry the torch. And um, so far I've been successful at doing it, but I've had a lot of support with other musicians that I came up with. As we continue, we are now becoming the old musicians. <laughs> you, don't, but, uh, you don't age though. Um, That's something I've noticed. Yeah, that I, a lot of people tell I'm me. I'm going to look older than you in <laughs> one year. <laughs> yes. But, um, but that's so funny because um, I did an engagement today. Uh, but there are two jobs at two schools today. Uh, and a personal friend of mine, Fred McDonald's, was a trombonist. Mm -hmm. So he always likes to tell the students that I was. Uh, we grew up in the same neighborhood, and I always had to cross him across the street as a patrol boy, but it was just the opposite. <laughs> he was crossing me across the street. And I didn't want to put him on the spot because I could have told the students, I said, well, look at look at him and look at you. And, and, and you decide who looks the oldest. <laughs> but we had, you know. That's in the Magnolia. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we uptown fellas, you know. But um, Also, yeah. Greg, will you just talk about um, your second home? Oh. <laughs> because the <Well, laughs> I'm going to say my second home is Scandinavia. Okay, yeah. Oh, okay. Your second home is this in Central City. Oh, where I'm residing at? Um, the Sportsman's Corner. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I'm way off on another track. <laughs> Most people know that my second home 
It's it yeah, yeah, your it's children still Scandinavian. Are, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but when you're here in New Orleans, if you're looking for me, I'm at second and D. <laughs> <laughs> And if you really want to see, come to second and D. <laughs> That's my, my little motto, you know, Steve knows. I try to make it um, a daily routine. <laughs> and I stop at second and D. I just have one beer. And sometimes I try not to have more than one, but sometimes it can't help it because you got so many close friends in the community. And I grew up in the community you know um i love my community so uh, i have so many friends that come through and uh, come on let me buy you a beer uh, then I, I exchange i'll buy them a beer you know but um we have such a good time you know the place doesn't have to be packed you know mm -hmm. most people tend to think that if if the building is not packed the bar is not packed, there's nothing going on. Mm -hmm. That's not the truth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a lot going on, you know? <laughs> Just good conversation. And then, you know, most of the bars in New Orleans have always been that way. It's been a, a place where people meet. And one of the um, first things I wanted to hear after Katrina was that they were putting a moratorium on the opening of ballrooms in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And I hated that. Yes. And I said to one of the city council persons, I won't call her name, uh, her name. <laughs> I'm almost giving it away. <laughs> but I said to her, I said, what do you mean? You're putting a moratorium on the bars, uh, a bar opening. You know, I'm just trying to make it seem like bars are a bad place for people to be. I said, one time, the bars was the you know, the center of the community where yes. people got off of work and came and sit down and socialize. They would dance, you know. They would drink the little setups. They, they had a quart of beer, two quarts of beer on the table, whatever they were drinking pints. And then at the same time, the bars were like sponsors of the little little baseball leagues when I was a kid. Uh, yeah. I played baseball for Shakespeare Park, <laughs> and most of the ballrooms sponsored the, the they had the uniforms yeah. that we wore, and then there was a lot of uh, adult softball teams mm -hmm. that were representing different balls from different parts of the community, different areas of New Orleans, you know, and. So what do you mean you're sh shutting down the bars? You mean you don't want people to be able to socialize, be able to come together? And, it's, you know, that's, it's one of the most important parts of the community. You know, it, it allows people to be able to connect with one another and be able to, you know, share memories and be able to connect with people, with, especially after Katrina, you know, People were coming here and they need to have somewhere where they could say, well, you know, so and so is in Dallas. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know he was there. Yeah, well, look, I have a cousin there also. Mm -hmm. Tell him to give him his number. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it was, you know, it was uh, it was strong for the, the bars to be open, you know, you know, the ones that were able to be open. There was there were certain parts of New Orleans, like uptown, that did not really flood, closer you were to the river, you know. Uh, Second and D didn't flood, and it was other place called the Purple Rain. When I came back to the city, I think it was my house. Well, my house didn't flood, but I was back in New Orleans like 31st September. And the Purple Rain was the only bar that was open. That's the bar that's located at uh, Washington and Saratoga. Mm -hmm. And that's where all the people were coming, and we you know, able to exchange where so-and-so was, was residing after the storm. And it was like a meeting place, yeah. you know, for people to come and find out well, who's over here, who's over there, wherever they may be. You know? But um, the bars is very much a very strong, intricate part of any community. You know, the bars are not bad. And, you know, a lot of times when, if I'm playing, uh, uh, the days were down in the quarters. If yeah, I got a little time, 
I'll stop by my good um, friend, Miss Seals, please. Uh, me and my good friend, Minnie Jones, the leader of Tremé Brass Band. <laughs> she was just talking about it. Then he might call me up on the phone and say, hey, man, what you doing? I said, well, I just got off a gig. I'm on my way. Man, come on over and have a beer by, with me about Seals. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay, Benny, I'll be there. <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, we can we meet and we have good times, you know. And um, so that's where I'm at with the bars, you know. Uh, but then in the second and D, you know, uh, it's like a hub stop yeah. for all the second lines uptown. You know, it's gonna be a parade in this uptown. You can put your last dollar on the fact that. Most likely they're gonna stop that second and deep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you, know, so, you know, I don't play parades as much as I used to. Um, but um, you know, many times when I was doing my jazz punch at the Intercontinental Hotel, I played there from maybe uh, eleven in the morning to three in the evening, sometimes two thirty. And I would get off and just hoping that I could get uptown before they got the second D so I can see what they were wearing. <laughs> you know? So it's, 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 you know, it, was, it was a hub site, you know, for most of the parades, you know, and and with the Black Men of Labor, we, you know, we parade from downtown mm -hmm. and my good friend Fred Johnson said, well, man, look, two places you got to put in it, little people and we got to pass by seals. <laughs> Yeah. You know, got to pass by seals. You know? so. And every and I love that part of y'all's parade because you basically circle her bar, yeah, yeah. which is really fun to see it coming from different directions. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, y'all, we have one more guest this evening. Um, I know we're moving. Do you, would you like to come up? Oh, Mr. Fred? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see you sitting over there. What's up? <laughs> My friend from Joe's goes and goes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Good evening. How are you? Hi, how are you? I'm good. Uh, Y'all, we have Daryl Press, who's the uh, founder uh, or the co founder of All in New Style Fellas. Founder. The, the founder. Yes. Okay. I didn't know if Sue, yes. so Sue doesn't get credit. So she's, she's the president. She's the president. Okay. Okay. Um, and also, he's extremely famous in the second line world for um, his delicious food and has a nickname. Pork chop. Pork chop man. He wore it. He wore it. I can see he has. Do you want to, do you want to begin by telling that story? All right, the pork chop story started. <laughs> Joe goes to Conda, <laughs> hanging out with a bunch of friends. So when we go back with the incense, when we go way back. Yeah, okay, yeah, the, the, the first brainstorm. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so I work in the quarters besides working at Charity Hospital back at the time. So on the weekends, I would go down there and do my little maintenance work at these kind of menus. I'm coming home one evening. And on the evening coming home, the guy catches me and says, man, I got these incense and I want to get rid of them. So I'm saying, looking at them like, wow, I bought more than I can handle. So I said, well, okay, give me a deal and I'll take them off your hands. I take them home with me, sort them out, bag them up, aluminum fur at the time. <laughs> After that, get on my wax. What you doing all that? So I don't know, but I'm going back around by the ball and see if I can get rid of it. I take it around the corner. Be a smash hit. I'm giving you a 10 for a dollar, all different flavors. <laughs> so everybody jump on. So I sell them all. So I said, What you gonna do now? So I said, I decided, I said, the guys sitting around by the bar looking like they're hungry and stuff. They're talking about food. So then I said, with the money I made here, I'm gonna take that and go to Rouse's. Rouse's just opened up, so everything was good. Got a deal on the beat, the products I need to make it stuff. But a little grill too, a little bit of grill, <laughs> bag of charcoal, barbecue sauce, which is crap at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Onion and the bell pepper, loaf of bread, buns, little knickknacks that guys might like mayonnaise. Get back to the bar set up. Mr. Joe gave me a little spot on the corner. He said, Dad, what you doing? He said, I'm going to feed these guys out here. They seem they want something. So all the guys, Charlie Brown. I mean, I can go on and on with Tremaine, names. Sidewalk, sidewalk steppers. So they say, D, you gonna, what you gonna do? I said, well, everybody asks for something to eat. Got a little something, I'm gonna hook them up. 
So next thing I know, everybody in the bar went and told somebody, press outside, come and press before they come and poach you. <laughs> <laughs> so he out there barbecuing the back of his red truck. So everybody coming out there and say, okay, we want this, want that, smoke size, high sizes, chicken, got to take care of everybody, right? <laughs> Get it going. Next thing I know, I'm a soul out. I'm as Excited. <laughs> so now I'm going to run back to Rouse's to get some more. And Rouse's going to still be late. So now I realize I got to buy enough, take a chance, not knowing if I'm going to make it go off good. Went and reloaded up, stocked up again, went back, bought everything. Everybody's still hanging, the beer's flowing, everybody talking. We all meet and greet. That's what we do in our neighborhood. <laughs> meet and greet, take care of one another. Sell all that. The bar closed now. Time to go home, wrap up, go in. I take and go home. I wake my wife up and lay all the money on the bed. I said, look what I did with those incense. She said, well, you did good. I said, what you gonna do now? I said, I'm going back in next weekend. <laughs> so from after that, we did that for a while. Then after things got good, we just thought it took it like, took it to the streets. We go to the second line, we find out who gonna be where. Cause everybody who got good clubs gonna be big, a lot of people. We go. We go by seal. <laughs> we leave Joe. Go back down the street by every bar in the city that's in the local areas that had a parade. That's where we was at. So the thing got to the point where everybody looking for the pole chop man. <laughs> and I'm like saying, I work every day of the week for the state. I work in the quarters. My wife said, you're going to be all right, babe. Just taking, we go make our groceries in the evening. And Monday, Sunday morning would be like an exciting day. Like, we got to get ready. Everybody up. You on point? We call them family members up. Because everybody had a job. I'm the cook. I got the grill going. I set up everything. From there, got this one lined up, a niece lined up. She takes care of the cold drinks. One take care of the people. The other one take care of the orders. So we got a family affair going now. <laughs> on the back of a little red truck. <laughs> Then I have my friend Carmen, Carmen Ruffin. He got a red truck too. So when we would be out at different stops, people would run into my truck thinking, because Carmen used to give his barbecue away <laughs> as, right. as a promotion. <laughs> I was selling mine as a muscle. <laughs> it's what we do. So when we meet people, some people say, well, this ain't Carmen truck. I said, no, it's down the street. <laughs> <laughs> but it went on for a long time. It just got to be a beautiful thing and it's original. And then we mainly do like, we support one another in the club. Cause we have our club from a club from uptown, come from two sides of the clubs. One is called the Better Boys, Nakuma Better Boys. Well, Dora Lewis started it and everything like this. She was a part of it. Yes. They had a sister club in the men club. She was right along with us. Seen us through, sponsored us, sponsored us, supported us. Then I get a brainstorm after being with Wardell Lewis for a while. Kind of like want to do our own thing, something different. So now I come tell my wife, I say, I learned everything uptown. How about we start a club downtown? She said, all right, babe. Here go one of your brainstorms. Things. <laughs> <laughs> but after doing so, it was rough. Our first year, we called something camels, like trying to get over the home. We pulled it off, 1997, the exact started all the club, all the new style fellas. Once again, it was right there with us. <laughs> our queen and everything of this nature. Now forget Miss Jackie and George, where we started our annual parade from. But like with everybody, you know, you're in a club and stuff. You want to give all the people in your neighborhood a little sponsors, hit, a little celebration, and we do different things. We back each other, we support each other. We start every year there. So then people start saying, well, what you gonna do when you parade? I said, well, hide some miles, the truck gonna be off that weekend. <laughs> 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 then it came a time I was a king too, for the older new style fellas. So they said, well, what you gonna do? I had a big old float, <laughs> we got out of kennel, got half the crown to off getting it here, <laughs> and then tape it back on, but we got it done. Then they said, we're going to be your grand finale. I'm going to have a truck that's pulling me, have a grill on the back, and I'm going to give everybody a poach out for free. 
that side that way. <laughs> and I got pictures of it because I got a little book. Yeah, that book? yeah. Everybody. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you have to. When we oh, back, my. To, yeah, it's amazing. My dad. Oh, my dad. Mm -hmm. You know, his, his nickname is Pete. He called him Neil Pete. But his nickname was Big Pants Pete. Because they say when he would leave out of one bar, as he feeling good, he was like pull his pants up, go to the next one. Who call red? Oh, uh, little people. Uh, Chinese, which is called the candlelight. And of course, Joe calls it too. You know, they make it back in the days, they make it rounds. Mm -hmm. Then they go on in. Yes. Nowadays, we just go to one place and stay and go home. <laughs> We're gonna be all right. I know soon. Yeah. Do you yes. love? You want to talk about like getting off of selling all the food all day and going by Joe's or Seals afterwards and like for like Sunday evening music and why that's so important in the city? Oh yeah. Well, see, like in the Sunday evening that you get off, I would tell everybody, I say, okay, look, I say, I pay everybody up first. I say, we well, all go home, clean up. We're gonna go eat dinner somewhere or something. And then after that, we're gonna go catch the jazz music, which Kermit was playing a lot at Joe Cole's at Congress. Then we'll leave, stay there for a little while, because we gotta split this evening up, right? We're going by seal, because she got the live band going on too. <laughs> so we're gonna make that run by Joe for a little while, then we're gonna split away from that, go by seal. And then sometime, if we had a little time left in us, a little more than I think, we may pass by bullets in uh -huh. seven walls yeah. back in that area. But it was a thing where is that, you just enjoy a Sunday because after a second line, you went out and enjoyed yourself there. You went back home, a Sunday dinner, mm -hmm. or if you didn't get some off a truck or vendor, something like that. Then you got ready, went to the next bar. Cause we want to like do a thing where we support one another because mm -hmm. each other, we live and drive off each other naturally. It's what we do. Yeah. It's our culture. I live in a couple of cities. Then a lot of them, and they talk to people, what they do on a Sunday? If there ain't no football, ain't nothing going on. Like us, we got football in second lines yes. or a festival. Yeah. And then sometimes some of the people in the neighborhood might throw a little festival. Yeah. You do concerts. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, so it's just like, yeah. it's yeah. never a boring time in our neighborhood. And I love it. Wouldn't want to live nowhere else. Yeah. Why? <laughs> Got something going on every day of the week. And they don't let them know somebody pass. They're going to be music playing for that person all during the week, all over to the day that you're buried. Mm. Yeah, this is it. I, uh, what, um, I just wanted to give a shout out to Trouble for his amazing artwork. Y'all, if you've never seen the old style fellas come out, um, it, at Seals, they that's there's you, you change oh, twice, right? Yes, so yes. the first time, I mean, you should tell the story, but it there's some of the artwork that their club does yes. is absolutely phenomenal. We made stuff of the simplest things that one wouldn't even think of, like paper plates, <laughs> paper white cups, and then the thing about trouble is like we never know what he's gonna do because he don't tell us because he don't want it leaked out. You won't know, and I live in the house with the child, and sometimes I don't even know. <laughs> I work a lot, I'm going back and forth, but you look at him and say, everything all right, man? Say, yeah, we may buy something, do something, he'll send me to the store, or we'll go to the store, and he in one area, I'm thinking you over here, somewhere else, but until that moment, moment, and that morning, you won't know. And I'm an umbrella fanatic, so I get to do my thing in the umbrella thing. I'm like known for umbrellas, that's my thing. And he makes them, but he always make them the half of the night before. So I don't even know what I'm getting. I tell him what I like, but he have it on point that day. And sometimes he'd be so big, I can't bring out the ball. Yeah. <laughs> can't get it, I gotta have it sitting on the side yeah. covered up. Cause you don't want nobody to know what we doing. Yeah. And he makes anything, if, if you think of a gadget, one year he did, oh, um, oh, uh, to call like, oh, uh, Let's go with this thing you call, like all the things you do with televisions. He had televisions from way back in the 50s and stuff. He made televisions of every brand and style. Then when he didn't do that, 
he did the, the road the radios and the things of this nature the boom boxes we still have it then when it come to funky umbrellas he do a funky umbrella like i ain't seen in a long time but he's so creative he's a genius of the club when it comes to decoration hands down hats off he need a crown or a trophy but and he won't say nothing he's humble he just want to be in his area in his own zone he be making stuff so small that you can't even see, but you put it together, you're like, wow. So I don't know what you're working on for this year, but you already got a year to go. So what's coming up, you just got to come see it. Trouble the man. Yeah. Trouble the man. Um, and Daryl, I just have one last question for you, which is that there's been some, like, uh, can you give us the report on what the city is saying about the season? Well, so much, we're feeling like, in a nice way, if you could do jazz fest, why can't we have the second line? Mm -hmm. So we're waiting and we're not saying anything. So we're just listening and waiting to see what's gonna be said and what's gonna be done. But that's how we feel. Because some of us that uh that that are taking, we go to jazz fest. So we feel like we could parade at the jazz fest. Why we can parade in our streets in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So I mean yeah, and I also heard, which maybe is, this is a rumor, but um, that the city was proposing that there just be one route for uptown and one route for downtown. Is that a rumor or is that something that's actually uh, We only know that we would like to run our route and we don't know nothing else about yeah. if it's true or not. You know, how rumors start. Yeah. I mean, because I would say the poetics of the parade are about everybody being able to choose their own route. Right. That is right? the concept. Because, like, if someone supports you, you want to go to the person that supports you and support them. Yeah. And everybody so, might be slightly different. Right. And you might not know the person that just came online that you might be sending us down the street to, to stop the meet. I mean, there's a whole lot of places on St. Bernard Street that we're not familiar with. It just came up. Mm -hmm. We don't know. But... but you know, what I mean? so, and then, how would you regulate a a, a a parade supposed to go down? What way would you send it up Claiborne, down Claiborne, around? I mean, what's the logic at with that? I just am going on the record as two thumbs down with that idea. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. might get ten thumbs down. <laughs> two, you <laughs> <that. laughs> thank you. I'm just talking about the one. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, well, thank you so much. This, I, um, one of the, you know, y'all have been doing all these interviews with everybody over the year and uh, hearing about Seal and Daryl's friendship was one of my favorite parts of. Oh, the, yes. Um, a long time. Long, yeah. Long, long time. It was really <laughs> great to have everybody here together and to have, um, Stephen and Caesar with Seal and, uh, and, um. It's so much love. Yeah. It truly is. So we got for each other. Yeah. For y'all too. Yeah. And that's so we got we got love. Yeah. So we love. So we feel we know. That's all we know. I mean that's all we know. That's all we know. Yeah, that's our that's our neighborhood. That's what we do. Yeah. It's like sharing food. That's why I called the um talk showing love. That's it. <laughs> hey, you didn't feel like that. Yeah, I like I bring one of that. Yeah. 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 I got it here. Oh, but what? I got something else. Oh Lord. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. I got a half a can of ice. <laughs> Get some um, more ice. <laughs> well, I'm all right. I, I think we're transitioning right. here to the social side of things, yes. and we hope everybody else gets to enjoy the rest of their evening. And yes. that y'all come um, spend some time at these wonderful places around the city that we've learned about this evening, because they really are the heart and soul of the city. And um, yes. We greatly appreciate y'all for being here. Appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah. Amanda, thank you. Open Hall. Thank you. Old Metal Road. Old Metal Road. Thank you, Amanda. Yes. Hey, thank y'all so much. This has been such a great evening. Thank you to all everyone that spoke tonight and sharing your stories and your histories. It's been awesome. What a wonderful conversation. We've gotten a lot of great comments from the people watching tonight. And uh, I just want to say, um, be sure to check out the exhibition Dancing in the Streets again uh, before it closes June 13th. And we hope to see you at another program here with HNOC or the Neighborhood Story Project.
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and also, if you're interested in the interviews, um, they'll be uh, towards the end of the exhibit. Um, we're collaborating with the photographers and the clubs to create narratives about each of the, the clubs that are represented. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Pablo Johnson, who's here this evening. Um, who's been my main collaborator on this. He's really, um, I have harassed him a lot. You know? It has been um, a labor of love for him. And I just want to say thank you so much because, you know, we'll get an opportunity to really see each of the clubs and the um, clubs, meaning the, per the organizations and clubs, meaning the um, bar rooms in action and without the photographers documenting um, what the scene is like and what the season is like. Each parade is different and beautiful in its own way. Yeah, but it's own thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. It would, it, we, you know, we would lose something as well. So, yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. And, <laughs> yes. Um, and thank, Amanda, you. thank you very much for helping coordinate this evening. All right. Thank y'all, everyone. Have a good night. We hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye. Yes. Bye. 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 Thank <laughs> you.